So that's the very last uh, assignment for you guys for this semester. And that's going to be graded as a project. Okay. Uh, I forgot how much person. I mean, just take a look at the syllabus. You can, you can tell. I think it's 20%, if I remember correctly. It's a robot car uh, being manufactured by the same Arduino board, uh, you know, the same manufacturer you have. Alago, I think, Alago Arduinos. And I started using this smart car a year ago for high school kids. It's a trail program. Trail upward bound, something like that. It's being sponsored by the Department of Education, and it's called Trio, T R I O. And I had uh, about forty students in there, so I developed a couple of tutorials regarding uh, using this robot car. But I deleted uh, some of the examples uh, because you know, for high school kids, they probably need more examples other than just tasks. And this car, this car can do a lot of things, and we are not going to use root tools. It's just a little bit too many tasks. So it is able to connect everything to a Bluetooth module and use a Android, or I think there will be a compatible version for iPhone if you're using iPhone. And you can download the app to your phone or to the any tablet and control the car using Bluetooth. So you can see this little module here is a Bluetooth module, but we are not using this Bluetooth module, but all the other ones, like this is an ultrasonic sensor and it's being connected to a servo motor. And there are four DC motors to control the four wheels individually. And there's a Alago Arduino Uno board. It's the same Arduino Uno board uh, as you have in, in, in the box. And on the top of that is a PCB shield. So it's nothing but it's just a, a cable hub. You know, have all the headers on the PCB shield so you can connect everything to this PCB shield instead of you know connect all the jumping wires to the Arduino board. So you can see it's not a customized PCB. Uh, it's just for fun or for uh, the developing purpose. So you are programming the Arduino board and and directly use it. So you are not going to develop a barebone microcontroller and a PCB. So I'm going to give the car to you, and I think I have uh, enough cars for you guys in the classroom right now. And for other people, probably they need to assemble some of the new cars by themselves. Um, okay, so there are several tasks. You probably need to program it yourself. Uh, if you directly use a code provided by the manufacturer, some of the tasks can be slightly different as the tasks they uh, put in their PDF menu from the manufacturer. So it's not really hard, but does need some uh, time. To work on that. So the first one is directly programming a ultrasonic sensor. So one is a transmitter and another one is a receiver. So you know the sound, the speed of sound is 340 meters per second. So if one here is, for example, this is a meter, it's going to send the sound signal to the front. And if there's an obstacle in the front, uh, it's going to be reflected, bounced back to this receiver. And that's because your digital system can can uh, have, have timers, can calculate this quick, quickly. So start timing that from sending the signal. And then after it receives the signal at the first time, it's going to stop the timer. So there will be a time uh, for the transmission and the reflection. Um, and you know the speed of sound. So you can calculate the distance between the sensor and the obstacle. Right? So you can tell if there's anything in the front of the robot or it's clear. Right? So look at this diagram. 
Okay, let's look at the sensor first, look at the module, how many pins. So the module is a highly integrated module. You don't need to manufacture or fabricate anything by yourself. It is directly con converting the signal being received into a digital signal. Okay, so if you look at the pins, the input and output, there are only four pins from the module. Definitely VCC just connect to the five volts of your Arduino board and ground. And after that, only two pins left, trigger and echo. So trigger, of course, all, both of the two pins will be connected to some of the pins on the Arduino board, right? So trigger is a signal being sent by the Arduino microcontroller. So which means whenever the microcontroller send a triggering signal, it's gonna send a series of bursts like this, sonic signal pulses will be triggered from the transmitter. So our sonic signal will be sent out from this module. What's next? Wait, right? Just wait for the signal being bounced back so you can calculate the distance. So after this receiver receives that reflected signal, the signal will be converted because there's a digital chip on the back of the PCB board of this module. To convert, it's gonna convert that received signal into a digital signal and send it to this pin. And this pin is also shorted to a certain pin on the microcontroller. So, it's going to be received by the microcontroller. Okay? So in terms of the microcontroller, the trigger pin is the output. The echo pin is the input for the microcontroller. Is that making sense? Because the microcontroller needs to send a signal to trigger that. And then receive a signal from the echo pin. That's how that works. So let's look at the timing diagram. That's a trigger input for the module, which is also the trigger output from the MCU. The MCU is going to send a pulse, boom, to that trigger pin. So the autosonic module is going to sense it and then send this outside to the air. So this is the electrical signal, this is the sound signal. Right, sonic first. Okay. And then after a while, if uh, input TDL lever signal with a range approach. So if the echo pin receives something, it's gonna lift it to a voltage high. So the that pin on your my controller can, can sense it. If your microcontroller read can read this high, which means the signal is being received, and just calculate the time between here and here, so that's the time, and time multiplied by what? And you can get a distance. By what? Velocity, what's the velocity? 340 meters per second. Okay, so the time multiplied by 340 meters per second, that's the uh, distance between the sensor and the obstacle or not. You need to divide by two because it's going out and coming back. So the two travels, it's a round trip. So time times velocity divided by two, you're getting the distance between your uh, sensor and the obstacle. All right, good news is you do not have to program the protocol by yourself. There's a library available. <laughs> so nowadays you can get a sonic sensor, you know, reading signals into a serial monitor in seconds, not even minutes, seconds. Okay. So here's a connection. And I provided uh, some example code for you. You can play with, just get it running really quickly. So you are 
feeling great about herself. <laughs> All right. Um, some tasks like a demonstration. So probably. All right. So I'm giving you a really quick. Like this. Yeah, I, I'm not going to play the video here. Uh, but you have an ultrasonic sensor connect to the mic controller, and you can use your hand, you can use the paper, or whatever. Smooth, move the object closer and closer to the sensor, and you can read all this data in the serial monitor in real time. So you can tell it's pretty accurate. It's not down to like a millimeter level, but if it's one minute, one centimeter, it's not going to give you two centimeter. Okay, it's good enough. It's just not super accurate uh, instrumentation, but it's pretty good. And next, the servo, servo motor. The servo motor like this, uh, it's already being mounted to the car. So after you, if you, I, I think you don't need to assemble it because everything is pretty much done by the high school kids and you can just uh, uh, download the code my controller and see if you can control the servo motor uh, to rotate to 90 degree and minus 90 degree like this. It's like a scanning, right? So whenever the car is uh, getting to the corner and want to get away out from the corner, so probably it's going to look left, look right, and see which direction has a, a last obstacles or wider space. Uh, bigger distance, longer distance from the sensor to the obstacle, then turn to that direction, and then make a judgment again, right? Something like that. So the algorithm here is pretty simple. It's like, so the car is moving forward originally. If you have a little maze in the front, you should guide it to into the maze, right? If it's not going into the maze, then it's not going to come to the task. So get into the maze first, and it's making a it, so the loop is uh, is trying to make a judgment regarding the obstacle directly in the front. So whenever there is something in the front which is less than let's say five centimeters, then stop. If there's nothing less than centi five centimeters, just keep going forward. Okay, but which makes sense because it's opening, it's open, totally open in the front. So whenever there's something within the five centimeter range, stop and look left, look right, and find a way out from there because you don't want to keep moving forward. It's going to hit that obstacle, right? So stop and then look left, look right, see which direction has a less or has a longer distance between the sensor and the obstacle, and then turn to that direction, and then keep moving forward again. Right? Just keep doing this. Um, one guarantee uh, for the car to get out of the maze because you can imagine, you know, sometimes if it's getting to the corner, there might be some uh, miscalculation or misjudgment because uh, even though, because it's just not directly into that position in the corner. So for example, the right direction can be more open, um, but it's not the correct direction to get out of the maze. It's not a complicated maze, but still, uh, I will say you have a chance of 70% to have the car uh, get out of the maze. But, you know, you just try a few times and just record, try to record the videos and just uh, submit the, the one which is successful <laughs> to the website, which is fine. You don't have to try it 100 times. Probably after three or four times, it's, uh, it's, it's good. So let's take a look at the video here. I upload it to the website here. All right, so there are several uh, different uh, modes, right? So different modes. So the remote controller can, you can select the mode you want the car to operate. So for example, what I did is number one, if I press number one, the mode is called go places. Right? So I, I can use, uh, you know, all the four buttons forward, backward, left, or right to control the car. Move forward, backward, left, or right. So it's, go, it's called go places. That's mode one. So I'm gonna use mode one to move the car on the top of the track. 
and stop. Right? So, okay, I assigned uh, the stop command uh, to okay, so the middle key, the middle push button. I push it, I'm going to stop it. So now it's directly on the top of the track. And I'm going to trigger mode two. So, mode two, I have to press number two on the remote to trigger it. So, mode two will be a line tracker. And since I know the car is already inside the maze, I directly pressed number three to trigger mode three. So mode three is, uh, I don't want to say it's a maze over because it's a super simple maze. It's just, a, yeah, let's say it's an optical avoider. Uh, and now I can see that uh, the car, whenever it's getting closer to this board, cutboard, it stops and start looking left and right to find a better way out from here, the corner. So here's the example. Just make a bad judgment, see? All right? So no, it's, it's not perfect. There's only one sensor on the car. You're not expecting too much. That's totally lucky, right? <laughs> Doesn't mean the car is smart. Um, I think I I got this result probably one out of uh, two or three attempts. Not really hard. I mean, because the maze is super simple. So just try like three or four times. You will find one time it's gonna work perfectly. And that's it. So if you can get a video similar to this, you are done for this project and also for this course. Right. There are some tricks. So overall, the code, you can see, it can be a little bit complicated since there are different modes uh, involving remote control and servo motor and the orthotic sensor. Uh, but these are actually not really difficult. So there is a trick for the um, remote sensing. There's a single line, you need to move it out of the loop to make it work. So whenever you are getting there, I probably, I can help you. If yours is not working, then I can probably help you to just move that single move. This will start working, but you don't, you don't, but you don't know, you know, what is that right now? So it's not making sense to get into that. So start working with the example code one by one so you can understand what's going on. Uh, if you find it's not working, you know, feel free to ask me. see uh yeah so i prefer using this one so the other one has a different layout on the remote controller it's not working really well i think it's a it's a defective product from the company but they are still still keep putting that remote into the box i just don't know why so i think i have enough of this type of remote controller for everyone here in the classroom so it's uh, pretty good to be here today. Let me see anything else. So I have a question for you guys. Uh, were, so you were in circuit one. So are, were you in circuit one to develop a car like the analog car, but not this one? The robot analog car? Have you done that? No, you didn't? All right. So the way how that works for the line tracker, let me find out the circuit. Mm, let me see if I need to do that. There are two things you need to know. Okay. Let's do it one by one. So this is a different project, but using similar principles.
because the DC motor or the DC motors, they are uh, low resistance devices. Low resistance means it's a heavy load because if you apply the same voltage, it's only like somewhere around 50 ohms. So five volts divided by 50 ohms, it's uh, like 100 milliamps. So it's a lot of current. That's why you need a driver in between the power source and the, the DC motor. So you, can, you don't want to directly drive it, use a DC voltage. So you need a something like this, but the robot car has a different driver. And the way to use the driver is pretty easy. Actually, you just part it up here and you connect. So DC motors have two terminals for each motor. So for example, this is one motor on one side of the car and it's been shorted to one pin, another pin. So these two pins are being driven by the uh, motor driver indirectly because these two pins are being shorted to the driver from the motor. And when you are trying to turn on and turn off the motor, you are controlling this pin, actually. For example, this motor, you are turning on this pin or turning off this pin to turn it on or off. Okay, so it just use a driver to control the motor indirectly. So that's one thing. Another thing you need to know is uh, PWM. So PWM stands for pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation. So if you have a pulse, series of pulses like this, okay? And this is one period, right? This is one period. And I can tell the time being spent during the voltage high is about 30% of the entire period. So we call the duty cycle is 30%. Okay. For standard, so for standard uh, square waves, what's the duty cycle? 50%. And you can modulate, uh, you can manipulate it, right? You can change it to 10%, 1%, or 90%. It's going to, be, it's going to change the average power being de delivered by this series of pulses. Because it's oscillating really quickly. So whenever you connect this signal to, for example, here, If you connect that signal, this signal to here, right? So it looks like it's turning on and off the motor really quickly. But however, the motor is not going to respond that effectively. So because it's so fast and the motor cannot just like on off, on off, right? So what's going what's going to happen is it's going to deliver a uh, equivalent power from the series of waves to that pin. If you have a different duty cycle, it's going to turn on and turn off the motor you know, with a different velocity. So overall, it turns out is the rotation, uh, the, uh, the velocity of the motor will be different. So we prefer to use PWM instead of voltage, uh, analog voltages, because you know your uh, digital, your microcontroller is digital. You, you do not have this kind of out, analog output all the time. So let's just use different percentages of different duty cycles of uh, square waves to control the speed of the motor. That's how we do it. And there is a pretty good and uh, very useful API in your Arduino microcontroller. And it has a range from 0 to 255. Um, I think so, yeah, 255. This is a, a a bit. So from zero to two fifty five, and if you put a number in that function, if you put two fifty five, it's going to deliver a DC voltage five volts. 
which is the highest speed. It's 100% due to cycle. And if you give a zero, it's going to turn off the motor because it's 0%. If you give a number like 100, right? So it's going to convert that like analog number into a, a duty cycle of the output from the PWM pin of the microcontroller. I think 100 is somewhere close to like 45% duty cycle. Uh, so you can tell the motor is going to speed not the fastest, but not the slowest as well. So it's just in the middle. Uh, I don't know what's the best duty cycle for this. You probably want to try it. And there's no certain answer for that. You can do sometimes 40% works, 60% works, and even 70% will work as well. So just try it. I mean, when that, whenever you are power, giving a signal to here, turning on, turning off, uh, there are actually two pins. You need to ground this guy. So the motor is going to rotate in one direction. But also you can ground so, so on the other side of the motor is equivalent, right? So it's another driver here, another motor, another driver. So let's say if I ground here and I deliver a signal to here, right? So it's going to rotate the motor in a different direction. So there are only two directions, clockwise, counterclockwise, right? So it depends on which pin is grounded and which one is uh, being activated to determine the direction of the motor. And you do not have to do it for the car because everything is highly integrated. You just need to use the functions, but you need to know what's going on in there, right, at least. And the driver being used for the car is, uh, I think, can be slightly different. Um, I couldn't remember, but they, they are similar, okay, at least. See anything else I need to cover? Uh, any questions? No? Okay, so there are the data sheet of the motor driver. Okay. Some of the example code. So for example, let's take a look at the code really quickly. All right, so this is, uh, for example, okay, let's take a look uh, here. Enable A, enable B. All right, so seems like there are four wheels for the car, for each car, but there's only one driver. So how do you do that? How to make it work? Yeah, so so the driver, right? Remember the IC driver I just showed you? So the driver is the IC chip has actually two drivers inside the chip to drive two different motors. And you just use the left side to control the left two wheels of the car. So the left two wheels of the car is going to do the same job all the time. They are controlled by the same driver, which is fun because you can imagine whenever it's going to left, it's trying to turn to le turn left, then you just stop the left two wheels and just keep spinning the right two wheels. It's going to mm, do this, right? It's the same, same concept when you are turning the car to the right. And um, if you want to turn the car faster than normal, Whenever the two wheels on the right is keep spinning like this, you probably want to uh, reverse the two wheels on the other side so it's turning more effectively, I guess, like this. And uh, yeah, you don't need to, to let the two wheels on one side spin in different ways, do you? You don't need, you don't need that. If they are going forward, just going forward at the same time on one side, right? If they're turning, just stop them or reversing, reverse them at the same time. Yeah, so that's how that works. And that's why there's an enable, two enable pins for uh, each of the 
driver on each side. And uh, N1, N2, N3, N4, I guess, these are the four pins of the motors. So they are output pins. So see here, which is pretty interesting. Uh, so this is a different driver, right? So it has an enable pin to enable that driver on, on one side of the driver. You don't need to worry about that. Where is that? You don't need to worry about the hardware because everything is already designed on the PCB. You plug in, it's going to start working. You just need to know um, which pin that one is shorted to. And you couldn't change, you cannot change it. It's already designed on the PCB, on the shield, PCB board on the top. So you need to look at, you know, I already taught you, but you can, you can also look at the uh, PCB shield and verify it by yourself. So let's see. After the setup function, and in the loop function, analog write, analog write. I'm trying to write an analog signal. So that's a PWM value, actually. All right? So it's writing a PWM value. So I give 100. So it's not 255. It's not zero. So it's pretty much 40% duty cycle. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to enable that driver using a PWM waveform. So the driver is trying to is already connect to the motor. It's already there. You're not changing that. But I'm trying to enable and disable that driver with a PWM waveform. So the time the driver is on can be changed, which means the total power being delivered to the motor can be changed. So it's actually controlling the speed of the motor. Since it's running super quickly, you couldn't tell. It's not actually on all. It's just like de delivering a uh, equivalent average power to that uh, motor driver. So these two lines will define the speed of the motors on two sides of the car. And you can see here, high, low, low, high. Four pins. For example, N1, N2 are the two pins, the two terminals, which are being shorted to the motor on one side. And N3, N4 are the other two terminals being shorted to the two terminals of the motor on the other side. So high, low means it's for example, high low is going to define the motor on the left side in one direction. This is giving a potential difference. And it's high low, but not low high, right? So low high will work as well, but it's going to be a different direction. And because if you want to, the, the, the car move forward, one, if one is moving, you know, like this on the left side, right? And you're looking at that, it's clockwise. So the other one is like this, and it's counterclockwise, right? So they have they have to be uh, uh, rotated in a different direction on two sides of the car to move the car uh, go forward. So it has to be high low low high. If it's high low high low, what's gonna happen? Spin. Yeah. If it's a uh, low high, high low, what's gonna happen? Back up. Right, biking, and that's a very simple code you can use. And I think I, that's pretty much everything you need to know. Hmm? So I'm going to give you the card. So check it really carefully, see if you're missing anything in there. Let me stop the recording.